Hello everybody and welcome to another VC video on my channel. I have not done this for quite a while, um, but um, right now I just felt like it. But on the other hand, I didn't feel like showing many records now. And uh, I thought uh, let's do something completely different. Uh, something that is kind of more in the department of blathering and rambling. But as I often say it's a really good uh, exercise for me uh, to speak English, and uh, so um, let's just do it. That's I, I want to go through a list of 10 things that I have learned from the VC. I've created this list for quite a while, and it was just lying around here on my table. So I just saw it and thought, let's just do it. Uh, and uh, I've put it here in front of me, and um, yeah, let's just uh, get on with it. So... Um, 10 things I've learned from the vinyl community. Uh, so first, um, I've learned from the vinyl community how to treat records. And that is something that I did not pay that much attention before that. And um, honestly, um, I didn't have, back in the day, I did not have that many records. So um, it was not uh, such a bother. I guess to some extent, there was also this DJ thing going on in the late 90s, and uh, this had certainly a strong influence on me. And if you lived surrounded by DJs, and uh, you kind of treated your records the same way, and a DJ often does not uh, pay that much attention to to uh, the preservation of the record, so um, you come to... You visit the DJ at his crib and he just has a bunch of records leaning against the wall without any kind of outer sleeves and um, we've built a lot of joints on record sleeves and stuff like that. So um, this is all kind of a well-known phenomenon. I never bought protective sleeves back in the day and uh, I was probably always far too cheap for that. And um, yeah, I remember that back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, people in general were not that careful about records and they they had not been regarded as such a high value um, as it is today because they were just an object of use in your daily life. So uh, people went to a store, bought some records and played them and had them in a little shelf under the turntable, but um, there was not much ritual behind it. And uh, actually, I remember a scene when I was a teenager, and um, kind of my 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 father's buddies sometimes had these parties where basically everybody was drunk like hell. It's probably where my general rejection of alcohol comes from. But um, I mean, I've I've seen I've seen my share of wasted guys in my childhood i could i could tell you stories but i remember one guy uh, i remember him getting up and uh in this kind of smoke filled room and half of the guys could hardly stand up up straight up and everybody was kind of lying around and everybody was completely drunk and i remember this guy was just stood up and says hey oh, man i want to listen to some old field man yeah i, I want to listen to some old field man so he took out one album by Mike Oldfield and he kind of managed to put it on the turntable. And <laughs> I remember the owner of the apartment or the, you know, the, the stereo and the turntable and the records was just lying somewhere on the carpet and not able to do anything about it. And this guy was just standing there. I remember how he was sliding with this needle just up and down on this record. <laughs> Hey, some old feud, man. <laughs> and the other, hey, you asshole, it's my record. Yeah, no problem, man. <laughs> so um, that's how uh, records have been treated in the 80s. So it's something I've learned from the VC that um, once you actually realize that you are kind of shifted to a higher gear of, of buying records, uh, then you start to be much more careful and uh, no one, no one, suddenly no one is allowed to come near them and stuff like that. So I've certainly developed uh, such traits. Now, um, interestingly, um, 
everybody seems to have a method how to store records and there are certain methods that are more recommended than others back in the day like five years ago people still made like vc videos about uh, how they store records and what they recommend and stuff like that i think those romantic days are a little over now uh, but uh, I certainly don't like uh, Blake's leaves that much. Um, I think they are the superior way to store records, but this adhesive tape is kind of uh, always a little annoying to me. So I do have probably like 5% of my records are in a Blake's leaf, but it's usually not a sign of uh, me kind of uh, valuing the record more than others. It's more a sign of I put a record into a Blake's leaf if I know that I don't really want to listen to this record, so I will not be forced to open the sleeve and take the record out and then kind of slide it back again and stuff like that. So, so record if you if you if you would go through my collection, records with Blake's leaves are usually those records that I do not expect to listen in the near future. <laughs> and uh, as far as uh, kind of the conventional storing of records goes. I just use very kind of normal average outer sleeves. What I do have is a strict method just how to put a record together. So um, they're all they're all stored the same. So uh, for me, um, the inner sleeve always goes up. Um, then uh, the outer sleeve is always perpendicular to it, and the the translucent protective sleeve is always um, antipodal, so perpendicular, antipodal. Um, so uh, when when this record is in my in my uh, on my shelf, you're basically looking at the spine and can actually read it, but you're always looking at the um, at the open part uh, of the protective sleeve, and. Um, that's just one theory amongst others. A lot of people do it completely differently, uh, and uh, but I think you create a kind of with this whole, with this whole perpendicular versus antipodal stick. You kind of create good protection. So not I don't think much much specks of dust can reach uh, the vinyl disc now. Of course, it's not as good as a Blake's leaf, um, but again. If you if you kind of grew up around DJs, DJs hate this because DJs usually want to have uh, everything open in one direction, so they only have one grab inside the the jacket and they pull out the record. And uh, with me, it's a kind of a ritual because you have to unpack it. But uh, that's just me, and I'm kind of happy with that. But uh, it's kind of fun to have this one method and just to follow it uh, to the letter. Number two. What I've learned from uh, VC is never ever put your records into transparent PVC sleeves. Now there's a very practical rule and uh, one that uh, makes a lot of sense. Now thankfully I've never lost any disc to PVC with one exception. And that's such a shitty record that I really did not uh, bother. Um, I, I actually, when I discovered this disc and I realized that it's ruined by PVC, uh, I actually nailed it to the wall just for decoration because I really didn't care about this this record at all. Uh, but it was good to have this experience to see how it looks after 15 years when uh, the PVC basically hazes your vinyl disc. It's a strange phenomenon where just where where, where the the disc kind of loses this black vinyl glare and becomes completely matte and uh, looks kind of almost dark grayish and the yeah the reason for it is apparently quite chemical or physical it would seem that pvc has a somewhat less stable uh, aggregate state that uh, tries to change once once the temp temperature in the room is changing and if it gets warmer in the room, of course, molecules of PVC just uh, leave the sleeve and go in all directions. It's probably a little bit toxic also. Uh, and um, yeah, they kind of transpire through, even through the paper sleeve. And over the course of years, uh, they start to attack your vinyl. 
So it's a well-known phenomenon, by the way. You can find some very interesting videos about this this effect that it has on vinyl. On, on, on YouTube, uh, people have experimented with this a lot. And uh, it's still amazing to me that there are people that are selling, uh, like, official official sellers of, uh, of, of, of records uh, that are selling, like, picture discs in PVC sleeves. If you buy a picture disc and it's in a PVC sleeve, just remove it immediately and throw it away. Um, someone told me an interesting story that... Uh, uh, like the first editions of Pink Floyd's The Wall uh, came out with a with a sticker, you know, with the with the Pink Floyd The Wall letters, and uh, I think I think you could kind of choose if you want to put the sticker on it, or if you leave it outside. I mean, unglued to to the record itself. Now, uh, apparently, there are people that can show you that uh, over the course of years and decades. Uh, because this original sticker was made up with PVC, they can actually show you that you can see how the the writing of Pink Floyd the Wall has been projected into the record. You can actually kind of see it like like kind of a shade. Now, in my case, my edition of uh, the Wall came with uh, a sticker, but in my case, they chose to use kind of a paper-based thingy. I guess. Probably would have needed a, uh, a a real glue just to put it on the record or something like that. I don't know. So no PVC, PVC bad. And those classical, those typical um, translucent sleeves that I'm buying by the hundreds. This is not PVC. Those are completely harmless. This seems to be a very stable material. Um, but. As you noticed, I'm not a chemist, so I'm, <laughs> I'm just kind of struggling with the words here. So, um, now, um, number three on my ten-point list of things I have learned from the VC is that I'm not a real collector. It's kind of an interesting notion. Um, one, would th one would think that if you buy records, if I'm buying records the way I'm buying them and then storing them, in my archive and playing them and talking about them, then I have to be a collector somehow. But I've realized over the course of years, listening to other people talking about records on VC videos, I've kind of realized that most of these people are a bit of a different bunch, more of a different... Their approach is different. The things they are looking for are very, very different. And uh, that's what makes them collectors and uh, the way they talk about the pressings and the way they talk just about about uh, the value of records and, uh, and how it all fits into a kind of a picture that is very different from m my picture. For me, it's just kind of a weird, sensual experience, you know, and... Uh, I would never go for buying like three editions of the same album, just because I was always I would always feel kind of uh, uh, kind of stupid about it in a sense that I would think like man I could have bought two completely different albums for that money why do I have now three editions of Sgt Pepper? It's like one one is enough, isn't it? So um, which is not right or wrong. I mean the collectors have their reasons to do what they do. But uh, it's just not exactly my my way of thinking about it. Um, I love to I love to own records, uh, and I really like uh, uh, if the pressing is in a good quality. But a good example for what I'm saying is that most of the time I would I will always prefer a repress or reissue that came out like five months ago to an original pressing. And that is just because, uh, uh, first first of all, I don't want to get into this whole spiel around the question, well, is this this original pressing, is this, you know, in what state is it, and uh, is it really worth the money, and uh, is, it, is it superior, and stuff like that, so... Sometimes I would just rather go and just buy a new repress that it's only like seventeen dollars, and uh, there is a, always a chance that these new issues are not as good as the original pressings. Um, in some cases, 
it makes no, no sense to me because a lot of the repressed stuff I buy is just top notch and I just enjoy I enjoy to just you know break the seal and take it out and have something completely new and just play it and I don't feel like I've been shortchanged because I didn't chase down the original pressing from 1973 um, so I, I never I never felt drawn to that at all um, I like I like to buy records because uh, they have a big sleeve, for example, and uh, that's actually so some, something that sometimes even improves on represses because uh, just the, the 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 print the print technology uh, can make a cover actually shine a little better. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes you buy something that's an original pressing from uh, 1971, and then you look at it. For the first time, for real, holding it in your hands, you think like, wow, this picture really sh looks shitty. <laughs> this looked nice on the screen, but this is not a, not a nice <laughs> pressing of the sleeve. The photograph is not as great as I thought it is. Anyway, this actually leads me to the fourth point. Um, and point number four is that I'm actually not an audiophile. So I do have a very good hearing, I think, and I have managed to protect my ears over the decades which uh, is actually an issue because uh, as, a, as, a, as a young man I could have spent much more time in the world of raves and DJs and clubs and just kind of ruin my my hearing through the decibel but I didn't do that and I, th I still hear quite quite well and I can I can hear things that are not accurate or or when there is just suddenly something wrong with the signal and stuff like that so um i i pay attention to that but i just don't agonize over the quality of a pressing and if somebody tells me yeah but you have to get this pressing because it's superior it's a much better pressing i just could not be bothered so on the one hand i think i have a good hearing but I my my expectation is set the bar is set rather low as a kid I grew up on self-recorded tapes and if I would listen to them now I would be shocked how badly this stuff sounded so if it's not if it's not too over scratched and it's just it just sounds fine I'm totally happy camper and uh, I'm I didn't have I don't have that many cases where I just put a record on a turntable and listen to it and just realize, oh, this is a really, really shitty pressing. There are some records in my in my archives that are like that, but it's certainly less than 10. And I have probably much more inferior records in my archive, but I just don't pay that much attention to it. So, so I'm kind of fine. So, uh, but it means that I'm not really an audiophile. Like... Wasn't there like two months ago, wasn't there like kind of a bit of a ruckus in the vinyl community because of this vinyl format where everybody was suddenly shocked that there is kind of a digital component in the production line and I don't know, I never bought these records and do you know why I never bought these, uh, they are called something like uh, audio, audio blah blah something. I never bought them because I always hated the idea that the record that I buy has this funny frame on the cover with this with this kind of a silver line at the top and I always thought like why are you fucking over my cover I don't want to see this frame so this this alone was kind of uh, uh, removing uh, this whole edition this style of uh, of, of, of record uh, production just out of my perspective so I never, but I never really, I never really cared about this whole audiophilia game, which doesn't mean that I'm criticizing it. Don't get me wrong; it's just not for me. Um, I like when the music sounds good, but um, just when I make a decision, I buy an album and then I have to stick with it. This is the album I bought. This is how it sounds, unless it's horrendous. But uh, you will have a hard time to convince me to buy the same. Um, the same album again just based on the premise that yeah but this pressing is much much better you will hear things <laughs> I, I, I hear enough things when there is no music running <laughs> so uh, that's what that was number number four i'm not an audiophile number five is much funnier number five is a really funny notion 
my point number five says that I don't know anything about music. So, uh, I think before I came to VC, which was like five, six years ago maybe, before I encountered the VC for the first time, I think the 15 to 20 years prior to that, I think my peer group constantly changed, have been, have been constantly changing and shifting to the point where not many people around me that I was in, a, in daily contact with, not many people around me could have been uh, described as, uh, as uh, kind of music professionals or people knowledgeable about music. So in the end, I was kind of the last man standing. It was different when I grew up in the 80s and, and through the 90s, but in the later years, kind of the people around me shifted and those were all kind of just casual music listeners. And um, so this kind of created inside of me the rather arrogant notion that I know everything about music. And it probably looked like that in a kind of very relativistic way. So... Um, when I encountered the, my first VC videos, I looked at it and I thought like, yeah, this is this, I should be doing this. This is, this is me. Wow. Why didn't I, why didn't I come up with that? I, I have to join this circle of people. This is me. But before I started, I just said, I, I, I set myself down for like two or three weeks and been just watching VC videos like every day instead of the telly. And, uh, I remember that the very very first videos I th I saw were by uh, I mean, the only the only three channels that still stuck to my memory is uh, uh, Mark and John uh, Doctor Rhythm, Big Star One Thousand, and most certainly Derek Higgins. Now, over the course of those two or three weeks, I mean, my heart sank because I was just staring at the screen and realizing that I know shit, shit. Karloff! Karloff is not worse to smell my shit! It was horrible. I realized that I don't know anything, that I'm a I'm an imposter. I'm a con man. I'm fake. People on the VC should stand up and point with their fingers at me and saying, Imposter! Imposter! You know, kind of like uh, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> horrible. I, I, I was completely flabbergasted i realized i don't know anything this is stupid i mean i didn't know these albums existed what are these guys talking about i oh my god so my my arrogance was really punched into the gut and <laughs> thrown out of the window and um well but you just get on with the program so you start to you take a pencil you take a piece of paper and you become a a pupil or scholar of those things and you start to write down every video that I watched by by Big Star or or Derek you just come up with five albums now of course you can't start you know rubbing banks to to uh, acquire all those records you have to make choices you have to kind of be be strategic about it but um yeah I mean I can say that after five or six years I have certainly stepped up my game and uh when I say that I don't know anything about music, it's, I hope, at this point in time, it's quite hyperbolic. But I still remember this uh, kind of, uh, this, this notion I had when I started to watch those videos. It was like, oh, this, I, I, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm clueless as fuck. <laughs> so, point number six. Now, the, the next series of three points are kind of all related to each other. So, point number six. Some VC people have much more money compared with me, or compared to me, so don't try to compete. Now, don't worry. There is not a, there is not a socio-economical attack uh, kind of hidden in this, in this notion or in this point. Um, it's just the reality of things. I mean, I have kind of modeled my life after, uh, I don't know, the dude from the Big Lebowski or something like that. And uh, so you have a, only a limited amount of cash that you can uh, cough up if you need records. And somebody is kind of in the management position of some company and he can cough up $500 a month for his records. Now, this doesn't this doesn't make me envious at all, I swear. It's just you can't get caught up 
in this whirlwind of trying to compete with that. So you can't you can't take every proposal that every every record that this person is showing you, you can't just run out and buy it immediately because otherwise you ruin yourself in three months. So um it's just uh, kind of it's important to understand that and uh it's I don't I don't look envious at that and think like oh you all these show offs and yeah yeah it's easy for you. It's not the case at all, but it's always important to think, okay, now um they can afford the records because the lifestyle choices they made during their lives. They created careers, they can afford it because they earned the money for it. It's uh, it's 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 fair enough and I benefit certainly on different levels of life. Uh, so uh, it only means that I can't define my entire life just by the record collection. And um, this is connecting to the point number seven, where some people, some VC people are doing this so much longer than I, uh, for all the reasons that I told you in through the previous points, uh, that I kind of started relatively late with it. So they are doing it much longer, so don't try to compete, because uh, there are a lot of people on VC that probably don't have a bigger budget available to them than me. Probably exactly the same, but they started 40 years ago, so that's why there's this wall with these 50,000 records behind them. And uh, again, no reason to be envious just because they had been smarter about it years ago. Um, nobody uh, asked me to start that late. So uh, it's just it's just uh, it's just it's just important to keep in the back of your head that you are not forced to compete with that. It's not about it's not about numbers, um, and uh, but it's kind of well. But of course, it it leads to a certain it leads to a certain notion or to a cer certain realization, and that, of course, in my in the remaining years of my life, um, I will never ever be able to. Um, catch up with those people because I have basically wasted the 30 years before that with buying only low amounts of records and uh, so you have to kind of find a solution for your archive just how how do I want to how do I want to regard my archive how what is it that I'm trying to do here and in my case I just made the decision to completely give up any effort any idea of uh, generalism of kind of a general collecting of records so you have to become a specialist and you define these five or six musical styles and that's more than enough we're still talking about hundreds and thousands of records you define just a very slim margins of styles and you only buy records that fit that style and ideally if you really want to have fun with kind of the VC culture, then you kind of specialize or pick on some styles that other people are not so uh, so versed in. And in my case, not that many people show around some uh, weird jazz fusion records recorded with Arabic artists and kind of sounding like kind of half Oriental, half uh, half jazzy, half that. This kind of crossover, kind of blended records uh, are certainly something that is popular on VC to some people, but a lot of other people are quite surprised by that. And so I can kind of find my own niche where um, I can still show things uh, that uh, people can find interesting or inspiring or, or that at least makes them raise their eyebrows a little bit and wondering, oh, that's interesting. Um, so sure, I don't go into a record store and look, look up uh, records by Led Zeppelin. It's just that's that's that train has passed. This is this will never be me, uh, because it would kind of open this kind of general rock world, and uh, that's just uh, um, that's just not in the. It's just not in the cards. It's not in the numbers. So um, I rather be. I'm rather a kind of vinyl specialist that has a uh, five to six different uh, genres uh, that are in my focus. And uh, I basically don't care about anything else because it's still I still have to deal with uh, so many albums, um, as I say, hundreds if not thousands, 
and, uh, and 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 you you kind of still open up a little bit your your uh, your cravings. Uh, I think during the course of the last year, as last years, I've become much more uh, kind of entangled with uh, sort of crowd rock uh, German seventies music more than I was before. Um, maybe I've toned down a little bit, kind of my Japanese proclivities and stuff like that. So, but you kind of you you always stay with the niches, and uh, that way you you kind of you don't have this weird uh, feeling that this kind of this train of the general uh, rock and pop record collection is kind of disappearing from you, and you will never catch up with it. So I, I don't even think in those terms, and I just uh, kind of specialize. Um, number point number eight, still kind of related to the to, to this theme, is uh, beware of snobbery. Sometimes CD is the better choice and cheaper. Now, it's important to mention that this type of snobbery gets never boosted or even evoked by the VC itself. Vinyl community doesn't do that. And that's one of the great points about the VC. When people make uh, kind of uh, tag videos or th kind of thematic, this kind of chain mail videos where you ask people to uh, do similar stuff, people always emphasize that this is not about a pure vinyl presentation. You want to show CDs, no problem. Hey, you don't have it even on CD, just talk about it, it's no problem. And I always liked that about the VC, particularly because, for example, you want like young people to join it, so it's not only, so it's not only us elderly, overweight, white guys, uh, you know, sitting somewhere in Europe with our record collections, because you, you want some young kids to join the ranks, and if you, if you, if you, always create this unreachable wall of, uh, of, of expensive uh, purchases, uh, then it will just not happen because the young person just says, yeah, you know what, I, I stick to my Spotify account and fuck off. So snobbery can always be a little destructive to any type of scene, I think. But um, this type of snobbery is self-imposed usually. It's something that, uh, it's a, like a weakness that can happen to you. So um, it doesn't need any trigger from the outside. And uh, it's you can quickly slip into this uh, false uh, conviction that that it only counts if you can present it on vinyl. Like, like if, you, if, you, if you have it only on CD, it's... Kind of only a half measure. It's only a bit of a cop out. And if you don't have it at all, better don't talk about it because you don't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't suffer enough for it. You didn't put the money on the table. You did not make the, you didn't make the sacrifice to the vinyl god. So, uh, so you are not allowed. And uh, this kind of thinking, most people don't think like that. But it's a danger. It can kind of, particularly if you are someone like me that came relatively late to the game relatively late to the game and you are mostly surrounded by these uh, kind of kind of vinyl collector luminaries on the internet and so you, you you quickly can kind of slip up into this kind of a snobbish thinking where you think like oh i have to i have to I have to stick to the vinyl solution because uh, otherwise i'm not worthy i'm not worthy but it's nonsense it's completely nonsense from the beginning to the end but if you're buying a lot of records you have to find a solution to this kind of thinking and my solution to this kind of thinking is that I first think about the music what kind of album is it actually and does it lend itself better to vinyl or does it lend itself better to other formats I mean if it's a for example if it's a 70s jazz funk record with this kind of a typical you know funky beautiful warmth um, yeah, that's, that's something that belongs on grooves. You want to put a needle on that. This, you immediately feel it. If it's kind of jazzy, everything that's jazzy kind of gives you this kind of vinyl feeling. But if I'm looking at some contemporary ambient album, it's like, really? Do I really? Do I really want to have a, like a double album with five tracks on it that are all kind of just wobbly synth sounds? So, um, and even... Good example would be Frank Zappa, because all my Frank Zappa albums I have only on vinyl, because particularly his 70s music and his 60s music, it has a lot of kind of kind of vinyl, vinyl feel to it for me, and it's kind of fun to listen to it on vinyl. But 
when I was looking uh, for, when I was deciding to buy the Shut Up and Play Your Guitar triple album, Kelly, I thought like, yeah, but is this really something I want to spend like 70, 80 dollars just to get all three individual records together? Or the way the music is recorded, the way the music is produced, the way the music is organized on the albums, does it actually not lend itself much better to a nice neat double CD that costs like only 20 dollars? And... Um, I've never regretted that. So this is my only uh, album by Zappa that I have on CD. But I always felt that this lends itself much better to CD. So I make this kind of decisions. And that way I've actually saved a lot of money over time. Because a lot of uh, things... I mean, I, I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say that I have many albums in my archive. Where I look at them and feel kind of sorry. Just thinking, oh man... Did I did really? Couldn't I? Couldn't I have just bought the CD, man? There are some, maybe a little bit, um, maybe like my 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 version of uh, Variety by Maria Takeuchi is probably such an example where I just slipped and became a snob for a couple of minutes. Now I bought this really mint, 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 mint edition with a obi, and I coughed up probably hundred dollars for that um yeah i mean it's an it's a legendary japanese city pop album sure and uh i could sell it for 200 probably now but um yeah did i sometimes think man i could have like three embryo records for that money sure but it, it doesn't happen that much thankfully um number nine on my list is um yeah, what I learned from the VC is that there is actually the possibility of a kind of a internet zone, an internet scene uh, that is without animosity and kind of it's completely inclusive and there is just no, there are no dogfights, there's no aggression, there are no insults, none of it takes place. And um, it's even, it's, it's so extreme as such that even people right now are making like funny videos about it just kind of mocking it a little bit that we are all a little too cute and a little too decent and <laughs> that it's almost that it's almost becoming distasteful but um it's wonderful that it's actually possible um because i kind of don't uh, i don't uh, spend i don't enjoy being part of some kind of weird aggressive uh, wise as dog fighting internet environment i don't have a twitter account i don't have a facebook account i mean you could not pay me to be on facebook and uh it kind of makes you automatically invisible to the rest of the planet which is sometimes a good thing and sometimes a little bit odd but um it's interesting to be on the vc because uh, nobody is uh really a just a giant asshole here it seems well maybe it is and i just haven't met him yet but it's kind of interesting because from time to time when I go through the video, suddenly something pops up where somebody talks about some drama going on. Like, oh, there is a there is a there is a VC scandal and we need to talk about this. And then you kind of look at the video and the person talking about it doesn't explain it very well because it's already reacting on a reaction. So you kind of go one one video back to the people that to the person that made the previous video that kind of triggered this response and then you try to understand, yeah what who, who said what so you kind of probably have to watch a third video that's kind of the original source to of it all and you kind of you have to go through the commentaries and then just wonder that's it that is it that's not a scandal that's just that doesn't that, that does not register for me you probably have not been on twitter <laughs> people threaten rape on twitter to each other stuff like that so um um so um we should be happy about that uh, despite the fact that it sometimes feel like some weird new age sect some cult <laughs> some cult of smiling so um anyway the number the point number 10 the last point i want to make is um and that's that's something i have not learn from the VC but it's a it's an attitude or a position that I have uh, formed through the VC 
and that it's that it's much nicer to talk about the positive and actually not to talk about the negative at all and uh, I, I think that's more relevant than it sounds right now the point is if you if you show me if you show me in your video if you show me 10 records and i know four of them and like them then i will probably write in my comment like hey i love these four records great stuff then there are then there are five other records that I've never heard before, so I'll maybe take some note from that, interested to find out how they sound. Maybe there's one record that I really hate, that I think th sounds shitty, the band sucks, and why why should I be the person, why should I be the one kind of spewing this poison on the internet? I just don't see the reason anymore. Particularly because it's subjective, it's not, it's not there's just no real tangible universal truth behind it it's just how i feel about certain bands and certain music but it's really not my job to taint another person's experience with with an art form that the other person paid money for so you you kind of you go you go to a record store and you buy yourself a new nice album by oasis or blur or guns and roses or bon jovi so basically all bands that make me vomit at any point in time but this is your personal experience i shouldn't be the asshole that kind of sneaks up from behind and tries to taint this experience like don't you don't you know that this music sucks this album is shitty from the uh, let me explain to you why this album sucks we did that when we were like 13 years old you know on the on the schoolyard yeah, Black Sabbath, man, your band suck, man. My band is really good. Your band sucks. Um, I think adulthood should be something that kind of doesn't do that anymore. And this kind of endless... But that's a problem. One of the underlying principles of social media is that we are supposed to thrive on an endless orgy of negativity. And I don't want to sound like some positivity guru, because I'm not, I'm a misanthrope, so um, basically you can all just fuck off. But uh, again, why should I rub this in your face? So um, I think the music for me is just this one world where I have the privilege and the possibility just to stick to the beautiful. Like, you like the same album, that I like? Isn't it wonderful? Let's talk about what we like. And I'm, I'm not saying that people should not criticize. I don't... I on, Honestly, I sometimes enjoy just uh, watching some video where somebody's slugging off an album. Um, it's, it's can, it can be very... It can be very amusing, but I'm also a little... I'm a little bit immune to that personally. It's just because my taste is sometimes a little odd which means some of my favorite albums are the most hated records on the planet. And uh, you want me to bring... <laughs> you want me to go down to my shelves and to bring Under Wraps by <laughs> Jethro Tao? Should I show it one more time on my channel? <laughs> so uh, I'm used to that. I'm used to people, sh people shitting over my favorite records. So it can't hurt me and I find it amusing. But uh, I just don't feel like I should be the one doing it to others. And yes, I can't like everything. There, I cannot be a fan of every band on this planet. There is just music that I just can't relate to. It's just not, just not my blood type. It's just not my cup of coffee. But that doesn't mean that it's bad. Maybe even there are bands that I even think they are really kind of lazy buggers that uh, just became famous through some weird flaw in the universe but again i just don't think that it's so important to tell it to other people i think this this whole journey through music and collecting records and uh, just listening to it, having a collection maybe talking about it it's like it's like a path it's it's your journey and and if if i think that this band xyz is just stupid then uh, maybe one day you will arrive at the same point and think too that they are stupid. But um, 
it's not my job to create a shortcut for you. This is your journey and your journey should not be tainted by my drivel. Also, I've really stolen enough of your time right now. I mean, we don't live forever. You can't sit here and just listen to my video. You are wasting your remaining years, man. <laughs> anyway, so um, this was my little rant, my little language exercise. And I really enjoy that, the ability that I can speak English that way. Because um, I don't know anybody around me that speaks English. So I can't kind of, I can't converse. So all I can do is switch on uh, my mobile phone and uh, create a VC video. So um, I hope this was interesting or at least amusing for you. And uh, it was a little little glimpse into my thinking about records and uh, the, tenth, the, the 10 uh, notions or things that I have learned from the vinyl community. Vinyl community forever! Death to Crossley owners! <laughs> I'm kidding. Goodbye.